Thank you, Robot. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the last session of the CSSR um, roundtable on 50 years forward, right? Um, I'm, your, I'm your host and uh, leader of this discussion panel, uh, Dr. Paul Garrow from the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. And um, I want to start off by thanking our executive, uh, our executive of the CSSR, especially Michelle Folk and Cameron Hamid, uh, and uh, Sarah, who's not here, uh, Sarah Wilkins Laflamme, for doing such amazing work and making this happen. It has been an incredible conference uh, that was so well put together and so well attended. So thank you to, to the, the executive and thank you to you two as uh, members of CSSR for showing up uh, in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day, the middle of the weekend. So I really appreciate it from my heart and uh, bottom of my heart. So, for, so um, what we're doing now is that this is a wrap up of what was started on the 29th with uh, Dr. David Seljak. Uh, this is a two panel, uh, sort of two, two set discussion between CSSR of, of how it's been, how it has been and now how CSSR, our sort of vision of looking forward, right? Um, so we have today, um, our speakers will discuss the current state of religious studies in Canada and beyond. Uh, the impact of neoliberalism on post-secondary education, religious studies in non-academic fields, and the precarity of the workplace uh, with the goals of moving forward. So this is a discussion that we've been having really great discussions all throughout the these sessions. Yesterday we talked for an hour and a half about this after our discussion around religious studies at the University of Alberta. So um, I'm really I welcome again further uh, incredible like conversation. Thank you for the conversation and to also put your conversation into the chat if you feel comfortable. It's also a really great place to uh, to engage. And now I've I've made it so that I can save the chat if ever anyone wants to see it. So just be just be aware that the chat is a public forum just like this is. Um, so. Without further ado, I will uh, invite, uh, introduce our talk, our discussants today, and then show you a bit of the framework of what we're going forward, right? So um, today we have uh, David Feltmate, who is from, Dr. David Feltmate from, the, uh, from Auburn University. He can wave, and then we could see him on the screen. Um, we have Michelle Folk, uh, Dr. Michelle Folk, uh, who's at Campion and Luther Colleges at the University of Regina. You can wave. There she is. Um, we have Janine LeBlanc, who's at the University of Alberta, Native Studies, right on. And Dr. M uh, Michael Wilkinson from Trinity University, uh, Western University. Great. So if you want to, you can put your, uh, your view into gallery view so you can see everyone here, or it's up to you, but I have it in gallery view and I love seeing everyone's faces and their reactions as we're talking. So the way it's gonna go is that we'll go step-by-step between David, Michelle, Janine, and Michael, uh, and I'll ask these these questions to generate a discussion, um, and then we'll uh, see after um, after the time that we've gone through the, about the four or five the four questions, uh, leave it open to the floor for discussion for added uh, insight, all these things. Right, we are very lucky to have. Um, long-standing professors in the room right now, right? Um, I'm thinking about uh, Dr. James uh, and Dr. Uh, Warren, uh, Warren here, as well as, uh, you know, Mark Chapman, you know, Brenda Anderson, Jennifer Selby, you know, like uh, uh, Tamir, Paul, um, you know, uh, Pat, it's really great to see everyone. There's too many to name, um, but I'm really happy to, for you, you to be here. So we will do this for about 70 minutes. And then we will close off our discussion and we'll leave open, we'll leave the room open for a sort of a close. Okay, excellent. Thumbs up everyone. Right on, okay, good. So the first question will go to David Felmate. I want you to introduce who you are, um, where you're from, you know, who are you from? Um, so just a brief pro, uh, professional as well as a positional introduction, right? Uh, like what brought you to the study of religion? So I just want to hear your story so that we can get uh, who you are. And this is the same question for everyone. So get ready, get ready, Michael. Good. <laughs> sure, um, I'll go first. Yep. I'm Dr. David Feltmate. I'm an associate professor of sociology at Auburn University at Montgomery in Montgomery, Alabama. 
graduated from the University of Waterloo PhD in Religious Studies in 2011. I'm also the co-editor of the Journal of Religion and Popular Culture. And within these professional circles, this kind of matters. I'm also a co-director of the Religion and Popular Culture Unit at the AAR, and I am perennial eye candy on these Zoom sessions. Mm -hmm. I came to the study of religion when I was 10 years old. Um, I was given the opportunity to study Greek mythology in fifth grade, and I ended up doing a triple workload, at, at which point my teacher stopped me. But I remember reading every book in the class and thinking, if I ever get a chance to do something like this again, I'm going to take it. So when I went to St. Thomas University in 1999 for my undergrad, and I saw that religious studies was on offer, I said, ah, that's the place where I can finally go back and be given free reign to do this. And I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Dr. Tom Parkill, who's been a longtime member of the CSSR. And uh, Tom was my mentor. Please don't hold that against him. And ever since then, I've just been fascinated by everything that gets covered under the banner of religion. And Tom really showed me that whatever it is that captures your imagination, there's an angle to take it into religious studies, which has uh, served me really well. So I'm going to stop there and let other people chime in. Thank you, David. Uh, Michelle. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us um, these last few days um, as program co-chair. I don't want to speak for the executive uh, or for Commer, but I just want to say um, thank you uh, to everybody um, for everything. It's been wonderful and fantastic seeing people virtually. Um, and thank you for your patience um, and your generosity uh, as we move towards this virtual conference. Um, in terms of who I am, um, a, a lot of what David um, has said, and I think a lot of what, for example, people yesterday said, so I'm thinking, for example, what, what Joe said, how he ended up taking religious studies. Um, I'm here at the University of Regina. I teach in gender, religion, and critical studies. That's our department um, here at the university. I teach at the Federated Colleges, so Campion and Luther Colleges. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Regina in Religious Studies. I did my master's degree at the University of Regina in Religious Studies, and I did my PhD in the Religion Department at Concordia. Um, I have always studied South Asian religions um, since I was an undergraduate student. How I ended up there was rather serendipitous uh, and accidental, to be honest. Um, I took a uh, Religious Studies 100 class as an elective, um, and I went quite actually, literally, this is what happened. Um, I went to go register the next semester for a psychology class and the psychology class I needed at the time that I needed it was full and the advisor said well hey you took 100 why don't you take this um, Islam class and so I said well okay that fits my schedule works for me it can be another elective right um, and then I ended up um, in Roland Miller's class. And those of us who know Roland Miller, uh, and some of us far better than others of us, um, know how we end up in religious studies. Um, and it's thanks to Roland Miller. Um, it's thanks to a Roland Miller who looked at me one day and said, you don't belong in psychology, you belong in religious studies. This is who you are, this is where you should be. Um, and I listened to him. Um, religious studies for me as an undergraduate student, when I was here at the University of Regina, um, I've always loved um, South Asian history, South Asian culture um, from, from as long as I can remember. Um, when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Regina, the only place I could take a class on South Asia was in the religious studies department with Leona Anderson and with Roland Miller. Um, but unfortunately, Roland's left. Um, we lost him to St. Paul. Um, and so I initially wanted to study Islam in South Asia, but unfortunately, St. Paul stole him away from us is how I'm gonna describe it. Um, and I ended up studying Hinduism in South Asia with Leona. Um, and I think that the other reason why I'm in religious studies um, is not only because that was the only place where I could take a class on South Asian religion, history and culture in the entire faculty of arts. Um, it was also because religious studies was the place, it was the space in the university 
that allowed me to study um, not just what we might call religion, but economics and politics and the social and gender. It was the only place at the time when I was an undergraduate student that was looking at these intersections, right? Um, people in economics weren't studying the religious component of economics, right? Um, they weren't studying gender and sexualities. It was the religious studies department here where that was happening, right? It was the place and space um, you know, where I could study these things. Um, and not only the space and place where I could study them, like the intersections of religion and gender and economics and politics and history, but it was also for me to be very personal. Um, it was also a safe space where I could study these things in the 1990s. Um, it wasn't always safe in the 1990s to be a feminist scholar as an undergraduate student when you, for example, were the only female in your class, which was my case many times. Um, I say to my undergraduate students, for example, that um, I had four, you know, female professors through my entire undergraduate degree um, and three of them in three individual classes and then Leona. Um, and so, for example, as somebody who identified early on as a feminist, as far back as I can remember, um, it was also a space and place where I could do work as a feminist scholar. Um, so it wasn't just the religious studies approach to culture, but it was also a space and place where those of us, for example, in terms of my experience, who were feminist, right, in terms of our scholarship, it was a, it was a space and place in the university where we could also, for example, um, take a feminist approach to what we studied. And so those are some of the reasons why. Um, I, for example, study um, religion and culture, um, and others of them are quite personal. You know, I, I had a partner who was passionate about what he did, um, and he showed me that there was a way that I could study what I was passionate about too, right? Um, and I think for me, I was passionate about religion and culture. And that's why, you know, my career, if you will, followed that trajectory. Um, and so I'm just going to sort of uh, end there with that, if that's all right, and pass that off, pass this off to the next person. Thank you, Michelle. Denise. Hello, uh, Gwe. Hello, everyone. Uh, um, I'm Janine LeBlanc. And uh, I'm a Mi'kmaq Ibi, so I'm a Mi'kmaq woman from Mi'kmaq, uh, Mi'kmaq territory in uh, what is Atlantic Canada today, called Atlantic Canada today. And I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Native Studies. So I have a long and winding road of how I ended up uh, being an Indigenous scholar who studies religion. Um, I started out uh, as, again, my, my research focuses on Mi'kmaq women's relations uh, with Catholicism uh, through pilgrimage and veneration of Saint Anne, so female Catholic French saint. Um, and again, I'm very interested in particularly Mi'kmaq women's relationships with religion, period, but Catholicism because we have a long-standing tradition of relating to Saint Anne as our Kiju or grandmother, uh, our relation. Uh, so I'm very interested in that. Um, so what brought me uh, uh, to, to the study of religion as an Indigenous scholar was growing up in, quite honestly, uh, a Catholic and Evangelical Christian home uh, where Indigenous peoples, I grew up in a traveling globally and seeing Indigenous peoples really fighting and challenging uh, the churches that they were involved in uh, and the other faith systems they were involved in to uh, really engage Christianity and other faiths uh, from our own ways of being and knowing. Uh, and I saw in particular very strong women doing that, um, including, you know, my aunties and and uh, uh, globally. So not only in, in uh, Mi'kmaq, but you know, in Australia, New Zealand, others really challenging uh, this, this engagement and really trying to uh, find a place for themselves as Indigenous Christians or Indigenous Catholics um, or so on. So that really influenced me to, to honestly uh, look at social sciences first in undergraduate studies. I started in the disciplines of history and anthropology. Um, I also did a brief stint in theology um, as well as I was seeking a place to really 
uh, do some relevant work. I ended up in Jewish studies and Holocaust studies for a number of years when I was in the University of Winnipeg as an undergraduate, uh, really engaged with the Jewish community, especially in Winnipeg. Uh, my twin sister and I, she's at Queens right now in Kingston, uh, we really engaged with the Jewish community and uh, learned a lot about not only Jewish interpretations of religion, um, but uh, you know, uh, worked with synagogues and museums uh, and, and other sorts of experiences that helped me then <laughs> start uh, focusing on history and anthropology um, and took me to theology and then back to Indigenous studies to really focus on Indigenous uh, interpretations of religion. Uh, and in particular, I'm looking uh, at Indigenous interpretations of all religions. So I'm very interested as well in not only Catholicism, but young youth and young adults who are Mi'kmaq, or Indigenous who are engaging in other uh, belief systems such as Luciferianism, uh, really looking at other types of belief systems like Wicca. Um, so not just Christianity and Catholicism, but particularly looking at those because they have a presence in our communities. And we've had and been building relations with our more than human relations, St. Anne, for centuries. So I'm really, really interested in that. So that kind of took a winding road and I ended up in Indigenous studies and I found uh, indigenous studies, a place to really uh, apply indigenous studies disciplinarity to uh, to a study of religion and our interpretations of religion, uh, given our ways of being and knowing, and particularly a place where I could focus on how indigenous women contribute to governance and the health and well-being of our communities through uh, their engagements with religion and not just our own traditional spiritualities but including those as well. So that's kind of what brought me to the study. And again, I'm, it's kind of branched off in many other ways and really interested. I, I really resonated with what Michelle said. Uh, I was also a student in the 90s <laughs> and I remember how hard it was. And that's why I found Jewish studies, history, sociology, anthropology, places where I could connect, uh, even literature, uh, you know, places where I could connect with really strong female or, or female identifying uh, folks and professors who would help shape this uh, engagement and interest and bring me along this path. Um, I'm also really, really interested in uh, Indigenous uh, connections with religion through heavy music. So talking about metal, dark wave, cold wave, um, all of these types of, uh, of engagements and also religion through uh, heavy music, but Indigenous artists and musicians in particular. So uh, that's, that's me. <laughs> and of course, this is still evolving. I'm, I'm still at the beginning of this. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Alan. Hey, Dan. Welcome, Janine. That's awesome. I saw David was like, yeah, heavy music. Good. <laughs> so now uh, I'd like to invite Michael, if he's around. I'm here. Oh, he Thanks, is? Okay. Uh, I'm like scanning. So there you are. Thanks, Michael. Um, so my, my uh, background is in, uh, or I'm currently in a sociology uh, department at Trinity, and uh, my area of specialty is sociology of religion. I've kind of explored from sociology of religion questions about Christianity, immigration, globalization, uh, the impact of um, Christians arriving in Canada from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, uh, so these questions about culture and religion and social processes, migration, have largely shaped a lot of um, my research and my studies. But it's it's a bit more complicated, my relationship with religious studies, than simply, you know, what I do academically. And it does also relate to, you know, more of a personal story of uh, where I have come from and what I've been studying and, and how we all really get to study the things that we do. Um, and so uh, for some of you who may know, I, I mean, I'm raised in Canada, but I was born in New Zealand um, from both a, a Mori and a Pakiha family background. And uh, after my brother was born, we came to Canada. And so these questions about culture and religion and migration and travel, have largely shaped my own life experience. And my mother uh, made it uh, uh, part of her life goal to make sure we got back to New Zealand quite regularly to, uh, to visit with family. And yet this sense of living in two places and uh, in two cultures has uh, certainly shaped a lot of my questions, 
My family wasn't religious when I was growing up. Um, they got married, my parents, in an Anglican church, but we never attended church until um, I was a teenager. Uh, my parents uh, came across um, some people in, from the Jesus People movement. And uh, if you know that background, a bunch of hippies out of California who became Christians and were quite zealous in spreading the gospel everywhere around the world, or certainly across North America. And as a teenager, I thought, what in the world is going on? How did my family go from, as we say in sociology, this low level of religiosity to this high level of religiosity? And, um, and so I, I kind of initially went uh, to church uh, kicking and screaming a bit um, and protesting and wondering what was going on with my family, but also kind of got lured in by the charismatic and Pentecostal churches through the music and uh and thought i need to explore some of these things because the other thing i found out is i didn't fit in i i got into trouble for doing a lot of things that uh apparently uh pentecostals and christians didn't do but i grew up in a family in in which we did those kinds of things like going to movies and having alcohol at home and those kinds of things that these very strict pentecostals didn't do uh, so I started studying theology, and even there, it was like, this is, not, this is not really getting at the questions that I'm trying to get at, and uh, left um, from that uh, study of theology to Carleton University, where I did a BA in the sociology anthropology department, and then from there, I went to Wilfrid Laurier uh, and completed an MA in the religion and culture department and specifically focused on social scientific understandings of religion, spent a lot of time looking at anthropological and sociological theories of religion, took a bit of time off uh, trying to find my way, figure things out, uh, but eventually ended back uh, in Ottawa where I did my PhD, uh, started in 95, uh, with Peter Beyer at the University of Ottawa. So I, I focused on uh, theories of globalization and my research looked at um, the migration of Christians from Africa, Asia, Latin America to Canada and what were the, the, um, the cultural, the ethnic and the religious or theological implications of um, what some are calling the de-Europeanization of Christianity in Canada. So a bit about me and my background. Thanks, Paul. I love hearing everyone's stories of uh, how people came to, you know, religious studies. Um, so thank you very much for these stories and uh, um, your, your coming up here. So uh, the next question that I'll be asking is related to the study of religion at the university. Um, I would love to hear your insights um, about why we should be studying or is it important or is it not? I don't want to, you know, just drive the discussion of why it's important, you know, though I am like, invested in religious studies, but I just want to hear like your insights about the benefits or the the impacts of the study of religion in your province, in your state, in to the country, Canada, US, or around the world. Just hear a little bit of insight from that. So we'll start with David. All right, so I, Paul sent me these questions ahead of time. So I took the time to write down some answers for this. And I have two answers to this question. So the first is my basic rule for seeking external funding. And that would be to look for ways that your curriculum will make money for somebody somewhere sometime. Explain how your curriculum will enable greater political management of people towards the ends of existing power structures, even if you're critical of those structures. If you can gently change them in ways that don't radically change their power and its ongoing accumulation, you can be brought into the big tent. And body counts. How do you either help those who are invested in the institution to kill their enemies or reduce what are considered bad deaths? And if you can show how your curriculum prepares students to perpetuate systems of power and education for a specific vocation or to work in a class structure that crosses institutions and helps them to maintain or grow their existing power, then you can find a way of justifying your ongoing existence in a university. But my personal take, and one that will resonate with some and fall on deaf ears for others, is that it's important to study religion in the university because religions are the cultural systems that build answers to a society's most important existential questions, and then give the legitimacy to all other institutions to shape our lives in such a way that we uh, come to those proposed good ends. Uh, again, proposed good ends should be in shutter quotes. 
It's particularly relevant to study religion in a pluralistic society because there are times when people will come to impasses that can result in existential and material crises that cannot be understood without understanding the ways that human beings have created their worlds and invested in them so deeply that they seem impossible to reconcile through otherwise meaningful negotiations. So that said, Paul, the answers uh, to concrete examples of such impasses may not be beneficial to governments or corporate entities, in which case we become seen as legitimate threats and are targeted. Wow, thank you. So, Good response. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we will move to Michelle. Um, I think that for me, um, I'm thinking sort of, and I'm ref I've been reflecting on, on the conversations we've been having over the last few days. I think that for me, in terms of what's the benefit of religious studies, right? Like, why should we be in this institution? What benefit are we to, for example, um, our local communities, right? Um, our provincial or state communities. And then, um, you know, the Canadian context, but by the way, not just the Canadian context, but the global context, right? Um, and for me, it really does come down to this issue of religious literacy and competency, right? I was rereading Aaron Hughes's book last night, um, you know, to prepare for this. And, and he's talking about how, for example, uh, the government of Canada's approach, right, to um, multiculturalism was one of the reasons why religious studies programs were established at universities. Um, and I think that, you know, why we should still be in them, right, um, is because of religious competency and religious literacy, right? Um, we know that um, religion has been receding um, from public discourse, and there have been consequences for that, right, in terms of increasing religious polarization. Um, and I, so I think for me, it's religious literacy competency, however we conceive of it, right? Um, and that to me is why we should be here. Um, and I think that we are the ones um, oftentimes who explore these kinds of issues with students, um, not only explore these issues with students, but explore them in the complex and nuanced ways that they need to be explored. Um, and I think that we have the capacity to do that, the training to do that. And I think it's what we do in a classroom, for example, in the context of teaching. Um, and, you know, I often sometimes say to people, for example, um, you know, it can be those conversations that we have in the classroom, right, with our students um, that can be more impactful, um, I keep saying lately, than a publication, right? Um, because they're the ones who then go into these workplaces and these workspaces. We have the capacity and the ability in that classroom um, to shape them in terms of their critical thinking skills, right? But we have the capacity to shape them um, in terms of religious competency and literacy, right? Um, and they can carry that into the workplace, but they can carry it beyond, by the way, the workplace. Um, they can carry it, for example, into their lives more broadly. Um, I sometimes say to students in an intro class that you know, we know more what I call facts about religion, maybe than we ever have, right? Um, and so a student, for example, who is not Muslim will know more facts about Islam today than they did when I was in high school, right? Um, but that doesn't mean we actually know that much more about Islam, right? Um, we have to understand those nuances and those complexities. Um, and religion really is, as David was saying, it's the worldview through which people understand for people who are religious, right? It's the overriding worldview through which they understand all of this, right? Um, the way I describe it to Religious Studies 100 students is it's the way that they, you know, describe how the universe was created, how humans were created, why they exist. It explains for people why, um, you know, it explains for them why there's pain and suffering in the world, right? It is the lens through which um, they either justify or challenge, right? What we might define as religious violence or cultural violence, right? Um, and it's something that impacts how people live their lives every day, right? It's who they are um, when they wake up in the morning. It's who they are when they step out of the door, so to speak, um, and they live their lives. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's something that we should study and that we can study. And I think that from a religious studies perspective, we do it, you know, from what I call is a unique perspective. But that would be my answer or part of it anyway. Thank you, Michelle. Janine. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Michelle and David. Um, I think 
kind of piggybacking on both comments. For me, my first uh, reflection on the question is, it's important to study religious or religion at university, of course, for diverse reasons, but as an Indigenous woman, it's an Enigma woman, it's important to study religion uh, to then help to decolonize and indigenize religious studies in our universities, in our academic context, in our academic institutions. So then I can help create a space for Indigenous students to also be safe and comfortable to express their spiritualities, uh, their uh, religious beliefs, uh, whether that's traditional spiritualities or other. Um, I believe it's a place, as Michelle had mentioned, I think a couple comments ago that, uh, or responses ago, that it's a place where we can do and engage in this intersectional analysis um, and a place where we as Indigenous uh, religious studies students or scholars or Indigenous study, Indigenous scholars who study religion, where we can actually uh, engage in, I guess, deconstructing some of these settler colonial interpretations of why we engage in religion. Um, so it's a place for me to, I think, do all of that. Uh, and I think it's a place for other students, Indigenous students. When Indigenous students, uh, when I when I teach Indigenous students or non-Indigenous students in other courses and in Indigenous studies courses, they're like, why are you in religious studies? And that's a reason for me to be in religious studies is for those students then to feel that they have a place to be comfortable and safe to express their spiritualities, uh, their understandings and their interpretations of religion, including Christianity, including Catholicism, including a diverse range of uh, belief systems and, and religions. So I think that's one place. It's also a place for us, I, I think, to engage in a really intersectional analysis of lived experiences of religion, which is really important to me. Um, so I think, uh, you know, all of that, uh, and also engage in arts-based research around religion for me as well. Um, that's a huge uh, tool. Uh, I'm a film photographer, so I, uh, it's part of my arts-based research practices. And so bringing students in and connecting them as well, like these interdisciplinary connections through gender studies, indigenous studies, religious studies, um, being able to express through arts uh, who they are and how they contribute to their communities um, through religion or spirituality, super important, um, through music, through dance, through performance art, installation art, all of these uh, things. And I think in the past for me as an Indigenous student, religious studies wasn't a safe place for me to do that. Uh, so I want to be a part of creating and helping with Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars uh, to create a place where Indigenous students can feel comfortable to do that um, and can really contribute to the discipline. Uh, and to other disciplines. So I, I don't know if that really fully answered the questions, but that's what I've been thinking about. Give me my thumbs up. Good job, Janine. <laughs> Thank you. And now, uh, Michael. Michael. So I'm a bit ambivalent about this question for two reasons. One, it could be pitched from your marketing department. You know, let's get the little video clips of everybody across the university and why you should study, you know, religion at our university. You know, well, it will enhance your understanding of the world you live in. You know, you'll be a more competent person. It's really cool to study religion. I don't know. All of, I'm not a marketing person. So I often, when we get these kinds of requests from marketing, you know, and, and development at the university, can you come and speak to these new students that are, you know, checking us out and whether they're going to, I cringe a bit because I'm like, I don't want to be the salesperson you know, that has to offer the pitch to someone as to why they should come to our university and study, you know, our topic from our discipline. Uh, and yet I know from administration, that's what they want, right? They want to sell something. The other side of it is, you know, I, I'm also weary of the sort of, here are the five reasons why the study of religion is legitimate or justified. In other words, here's my apologetic for the study of religion. Number one, you know, religion will make you, you know, understand our humanity. Number two, religion is a way to foster, you know, dialogue with people that are different than you. Number three, religion will give you a, an appreciation. Like all of the things that we've all been saying, I agree with. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, 
I mean, there's also this, this sort of utilitarian, I, I'm in a sociology department, I'm not in a religious studies department. And so I know, you know, our religious studies department, even at a university that's sponsored by a, you know, a denomination, and it's a Christian university, nobody wants to do a degree in the religious studies department, you know, like no one is majoring in it, they're talking about cutting programs, you know, and so the same kinds of issues that religious studies at Trinity Western, you know, is facing, other universities are facing, it's just, and when I do teach my sociology religion class, one of the things I find out, boy, there's a lot of students who even come from either, you know, and, and we have, you know, students who come from different backgrounds, so either a Christian home or a Sikh home or, a, you know, whatever it may be, you know, a Muslim home, they really don't know a whole lot about religion. And this is a 300 level sociology religion course where it's, I feel like, okay, let's start from the very basics about you know, the names of the religions. And in sociology, they don't have to do a world religions course. So they, they may not have that background or even on, on some of these, these things. So, but in the sociology department, we're doing well. Our department's growing, you know, so there isn't this sense of like, I need to sell what we are and what we're doing and the value, even the utilitarian value of religious studies, because, you know, there are these questions, which I think is what this question and some of these questions for this session are getting at. Um, is there a future for religious studies, you know, at the university? Uh, and I, and so anyways, Paul, I may not have answered your question, but I'm, I'm, I'm picking some aspects to uh, talk about the question and get at what are we really trying to get at when we ask this question? And I, and I'm wondering if it is about the future of religious studies. And um, uh, maybe I'll come to it in the next round of questions that you want to ask, but maybe it would be time to talk about the end of religious studies. Woo! Oh my God, Michael, right on. Uh, thank you so much. That was incredibly insightful and wonderfully honest. Um, so I think right now for, in terms of like, just seeing how what the way what, what Michael is talking about to maybe collapse the last two questions and sort of ex, uh, talk about your experience one after that, of austerity in university and the the sort of the fragmentation of the study of religion as a discipline but also to with that maybe talk about how do we improve visibility of the study of religion in Canada um, where do we go from here what are your thoughts for the future because this is about us, 50 years forward, right? So we will start with David. Okay, um, so we're gonna collapse these two questions. You bet. How do you grow uh, low numbers of majors and a lack of bringing in external funds is the first big problem that comes to mind. Uh, the fact that many of us have learned to survive by speaking across disciplines also makes us easier to absorb into different units. And uh, Michael, as somebody else who's in a sociology department, I think one of the questions is always, how, first of all, how are we seen as building good, efficient managers of different populations? Um, and what are the topics that we continue to hire in and that drive the development of sociology and by bringing that into the discussion here in religious studies, we can also see that sociology itself is moving, or as, as Lauren Dawson put it to me when I was a graduate student at the University of Waterloo, uh, sociology is in some ways a victim of its own success by creating and spinning off things like criminology, um, health and illness studies, whereas religious studies doesn't tend to generate that sort of direct into uh, a profession type of model. So, you know, um, the fact that many of us have learned to survive by speaking across disciplines makes us easier to absorb into different units. And so cutting an RS department out of the operations budget and moving those faculty into other larger units that can then repurpose the tenure line when one of us moves, retires, or dies is also another way of managing university resources in the long term in a way that slowly strangles religious studies out of existence. Um, but to improve the visibility of departments of religion requires, I think, a at minimum two-pronged approach. 
every department or program should have somebody who's working on research that's considered relevant today, and they need to be trained to speak to local and national media. The department then needs to get a hold of the university's outreach programs and start promoting that colleague and their work, and that person has to go out there and be the face of the discipline on these media. To that end, don't let that person be a selfish jerk. They need to be willing and required to promote their colleagues in the department and across the CSSR so that RS as a whole benefits, This speaking specifically to the Canadian environment. If they're going to see this as selfish self-promotion rather than building a career that can then be leveraged to help others, then don't cultivate that person in the first place. Uh, that will help slowly build up the recognition that there's a large group of scholars engaged in a debate about religion and its place in society that wants the public to engage with us. And I think that a lot of the time we sort of roll our eyes at public understandings of religion as a problem to be solved rather than people to be engaged with. Uh, that will also require that we figure out how to talk to the public without sacrificing our integrity, which is often one of the reasons that we are suspicious of media when we don't have control over the final use of our words and we fear being taken out of context. And as somebody who among other things, works in new religious movements, uh, that's a real concern for scholars in that field, the way that, um, you know, if you say the wrong thing, somebody might get arrested, families might get broken up, or people might get killed. So there are very real, uh, serious consequences to what we can say in certain contexts. Another thing, and a place where Canadian religious studies needs to take the lead globally is in dealing with decolonizing the curriculum and in coming to think of what reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is going to look like. Uh, I think that this will also require people to fight hard to think about the painful sacrifices in terms of money and property that reconciliation will cost and to not shy away from relinquishing the material sources of power that our institutions hold and hoard and that we directly benefit from, especially people like myself who have tenure stream positions. And religious studies, I think, has the tools to deal with the deep language and ideas that people are going to need to remake the world. And to also understand why the fights back are seen as existential. We have a part to play in this work. It's not just us, it's across the universities, uh, across the departments. And I think that uh, Canadian scholars are a decade or more ahead of other nations in terms of trying to figure this out. Plus you have a public that is continually engaged with this discussion in ways that other nations just are not. And I speak as somebody who is in the United States. Um, my university does not have a, a native land claim and the statement about native land claims is not even on our radar. To that end, every department in Canada needs to have somebody who's tenured and willing to stick their neck out in this fight. This is something that the CSSR can organize across universities and with other academic societies and work to bring the resolutions into discussions with colleagues in other countries. Uh, so what's normal and obvious in Canadian universities, speaking as somebody in the United States, it's, it's not even on our radar. Uh, you have a head start in working through this issue, which influences every major institution on this continent and other places throughout the world. And one other thing, Paul, is, uh, you know, the way you originally phrased the question in the email is that it was asked by somebody at a large public research university. For most of us, getting the idea that religious studies is something that's relevant to the greater public is secondary to getting students to take our courses and ultimately major in them if we want to preserve the kinds of jobs that could eventually lead to the promotion of religious studies in the broader culture. Uh, number one, hire good teachers who care deeply about their students. Every RS department should make it their miss mission to be the best department in terms of offering students a rigorous education which people, with people who care about those students at the helm. Every student who walks through your doors, it is your responsibility to help them find a piece of themselves through the work and their interactions with you or they should be encouraged to go elsewhere and find that thing. Um, I've had plenty of students who have just said, you know, you finished a course with me, you made it through, congratulations, but your real 
interest is in maybe psychology or political science or business, and you should go over there. And sometimes, you know, universities don't like to hear that uh, when we're encouraged to use introductory courses to try to build majors, but I think students um, really come to see and respect faculty who care about them first and you know, the university is big enough that not everybody needs to be a religious studies major, but they should all know that the religious studies faculty care about them as people and not as numbers on a ledger. They're already keenly aware that there's a faceless bureaucracy that's trying to get as much money out of them as possible. Ask students about all of those extra fees that uh, they weren't originally warned about. Uh, we need to make it our goal to be that difference maker in those students' lives. And now I say this as somebody who's able to do that because my university capped its classes at 35 students when we're not socially distancing. But that focus on cultivating students into who they are and can be is central to my department. Uh, every time we hire somebody, I tell my colleagues that the one line in the sand is that we have to be able to trust our students with this person we're bringing in. Uh, it may not save the department, as financial and cultural pressures continuously drive students to majors that lead directly into obvious employment opportunities, such as medicine or social work. But we can be known as nimble entities that take students seriously and teach them the liberal arts, which I have really come to think of as the tools of a free person to navigate a world that is constantly trying to enslave them and be a place where they can grow, change, and ultimately become something different than what anybody ever imagined they could be. And those of us who've had the privilege of teaching for a while, we kind of see this as a normal part of the process, and we kind of forget how amazing it actually is to people outside of our little circle and milieu. So yeah, that, those are my answers to what we should and need to do. And on that last point about looking after students and teaching them the liberal arts, if we give that up to save departments, we deserve to die, right? It is better to teach the people and let this, uh, the ship go down than it is to try to save something that just produces the next uh, generation of middle management because even they're being cut sourced out um, yeah I've never once regretted the undergraduate uh, education that I got at St. Thomas and I know that other people are getting that at different universities and it's literally priceless to me and that's what I go in uh, every day looking for a student. Every time I go into an intro class or my social problems or world religions, I'm always looking for that opportunity to find and be part of changing that student into something that I don't even know what they're going to become. Mm -hmm. But it's always worth it. And if you're not in this business to do this, then please get out because the money's not good enough to keep you in. Thanks, David. And I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I would, um, <clears throat> I would, I think, um, if David doesn't mind, agree <laughs> um, uh, with what he's talking about. Um, I think that um, for me in the context of what I do and how I research and how I teach, um, I, a lot of what David is saying is, is resonating for me. Um, you know, teaching, and it's important in its value. And I, unlike David, who doesn't, I, unlike David, I don't have the protection of tenure. I'm a precarious worker. Um, so I, in the context of this conversation, need to be very careful about what I say for very different reasons. Um, I am also, a, by the way, our students are also precarious workers. Um, that's a conversation we tend not to have. Um, I agree with with Michael in terms of the question of like that question of like why study religion, right? Like that question bothers me too, um, you know, because I I I wonder if our colleagues in poli sci get that question, right? Like why study political science? 
why study economics? Like it's assumed that they deserve to be in the university, right? That question, why study religion, right? It, 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 I'm uncomfortable with it because it assumes that maybe we shouldn't be there, right? Like it's a question that I think colleagues in women's and gender studies get too, like why study women, right? Um, and I think that question is used not necessarily by us, that's not what I'm saying, but I do think it's used in the university environment as a way of devaluing what we do, right? Um, and, and I say that in part because of my own experience, right? I was an undergraduate student studying religion in the 1990s. Um, the question that I got all the time was from people was, well, why are you studying religion? Like, what are you gonna do with that? Like, how are you going to pay your bills, right? Um, and I got that question from my parents. I'm okay admitting that fact, um, to which I always responded, I don't know, but I'll figure a way out, right? Um, you know, that, that's a common question that we get that I'm not sure our colleagues in anthropology necessarily get. Though I do think, however, that question, I do think students in anthropology and sociology and poli sci are getting that question more and more and more today, right? Um, and I say that because the issues that we're struggling with aren't, aren't issues that we alone are struggling with, right? It's the humanities and social sciences and more so even the humanities than the social sciences, right? Um, I just out of curiosity did, did not even a, a deep dive last night, but a superficial dive, right, into some statistics um, that I haven't looked at in a little bit. And for example, we know that neoliberalism, right, is in universities. We know that universities today are focused on accreditation. We know that they're focused on their professional programs, right? Um, we know that, that employers, right, are demanding that universities train their future employees to have certain skills, right? We just don't know necessarily or always what those skills are. Like the demands that employers have, those skill sets, they're continually changing those demands that they're making of universities in terms of those skill sets, right? Um, but we know, for example, in Canada, that if you look at, at degrees, right, we know that bachelor's degrees, if we look at bachelor's degrees compared to college degrees, compared to a high school diploma or an apprenticeship or apprenticeship certificate, sorry, we know that a bachelor's degree, right, that that person with a bachelor's degree makes more money, right, except in Saskatchewan, if you're a man and you have a, an apprenticeship certificate, you're making more money, right? But then the question becomes, which bachelor's degree is making money? Well, it's engineering and it's nursing. And where are the liberal arts? Well, the liberal arts, the humanities are the lowest, right? And so what ha what's happening statistically, for example, is, and there's, again, Stats Canada found that one third of students who do what we would call humanities degrees, those liberal arts degrees, right? They're going on, they see it purely as a stepping stone, right? To give them those critical thinking skills that we're so good at giving them. Um, but they're only using us at a, as a stepping stone, right? And they're actually going on to do further university degrees. And so I think some of our conversation needs to actually be wrapped around this issue, right? Um, how do we challenge, how do we respond to what is this neoliberalist, no, neoliberal agenda, right? Um, I, I kind of, you know, how do we, you know, address these issues if, if, society, students, institutions, see us as stepping stones, right? Um, and are asking us, you know, why study religion, right? Um, again, as a way I always say of, of in some ways questioning why we're, why we're here, right? And so we're, we're having to deal, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but we're having to deal with these questions. History is grappling with these questions, right? Political science is grappling with these questions. We're all trying to figure out ways to survive. And we're doing things like amalgamating departments. But what's the consequence five years from now of that amalgamation, right? What is the forward thinking that we need to be mindful of, right? Survival, sometimes what we do in the context of survival is it's meant to be, you know, survive in the short term, but what about the long term, right? And that's why these conversations are so important because it gets us thinking about that long term, right? It gets us moving towards that kind of visioning. So I'm going to sort of wrap that up and I'm going to say, Janine, please. Thank you. 
Thank you, Michelle and David, for such amazing uh, inspiration for me, uh, especially uh, uh, as I'm a PhD candidate still, and really looking forward to these these other parts of the journey ahead um, and present. I am teaching right now, so it it has given me a chance to reflect even more on the teaching that I'm doing with students. And I really liked what David said too all of it. I all resonated with a lot of that, of what David uh, mentioned in his response, um, and particularly this caring for students. For me, <laughs> having such a privilege to care for the last three courses I've taught over the last three semesters has been amazing. Um, and to be able to take the time for me as, uh, you know, we all have busy schedules and we all have all of these competing demands, especially in this global pandemic, um, to be able to sit with students uh, and care for them in ways that are real and not just to complete the course. I mean, I had a, a Zoom call with students the other day and we were all just chatting um, about some of the course materials and some of the art we were viewing together um, and, and talking about in terms of you know, some of the, the new discoveries uh, of uh, residential school uh, in Kamloops. And, uh, you know, just being able to sit with them and hear how they were reflecting on these uh, these, uh, you know, these occurrences, these historical um, and contemporary occurrences of genocide was just fantastic. And I realized in a class of 20 people, you can do that. But being a available for students, um, you know, just to, to chat, you know, I told my students at the end of this course, just because I'm not your instructor anymore, doesn't mean, mean we don't have relation. You know, we're, we're in relation. We're in relation as we go through this course. We're in relation with each other's humans, with more than humans, as we, we talk and work through this course together. Um, and it doesn't end there. So please, as you're reflecting on these extra tools I've given you through podcasts, through art installations, through music, please message me back. I'll Zoom with you. I want to hang out. I want to talk to you about the music you're listening to and why I want to talk to you about the music you're making and why I want to talk to you about the art you're making and why. Um, reflecting on religion, reflecting on all of these other types of intersections. Um, and, and I think that that's so important. It's like, they're like, well, are you teaching another course? When are you teaching another course? And I'm like, well, I'm not right now, but you know, um, I'll let you know. But because we can be in relation after this, you get to know when. And it's like, for me, that was really exciting. Um, and just humbling and, you know, honestly, it, it like broke down this divide. I know I'm an instructor. I know I've, you know, I'm a PhD candidate now, but that was really important to me. It was super valuable. And I think, I know it may sound naive at the beginning of my career, but I hope I have that in the years ahead. I hope I have that. I hope I'm able to sit with students. And I know when we have 180 students in a class or 500 students, we can't always do it in the same way, but I really hope I can offer some of that because those relationships are really important. Um, and I want to know what art they're making based on the materials they've reflected on in my course. I want to hear about the discussions they're having with their settler friends who don't know anything about Indigenous or very little about Indigenous experiences, lived experiences in Canada. So for me, that was super important. Again, David and Michelle also talk, again, about decolonization. For me, it's even more than that. It's decolonization and indigenization of uh, religious studies uh, and really just uh, looking at religion from our interpretations of religion. Um, not settler colonial explanations of what we're doing when we engage religion. Um, and that's also for me really important through the arts. So students can express themselves through music. They can express themselves through painting, textiles, um, you know, photography, uh, and talk about the relations with more than humans um, in, in these contexts. So for me, that's a huge part of, uh, you know, improving this the visibility it may sound really practical but i deal in practical <laughs> i love theorizing about this stuff but i love practical because i see students engaging uh these these theories that we're talking about in really practical ways in their own lives you know they're going playing in bands they're going in you know they're they're thinking about these things as indigenous and non-indigenous students so that for me is super important um and i think that that's why i'm I'm here in religious studies. You know, I see myself as a very transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary scholar. Um, and so 
that excites me, um, being able to talk about these things. Um, you know, I'm really involved in music scenes, even in Scandinavia and stuff. And they're always talking about religion. We're always talking about religion. And, uh, you know, and this is, you know, really exciting. It's really relevant to people my age and younger. Um, and so like that, that, that pro helping create and facilitate or um, even, you know, uh, partner with people who are already doing that um, globally is like super important. And I think religious studies offers a, a place for students to do that. Um, so anyways, that's my, that's my reflections. It really just is an add on and just really, uh, really enjoyed uh, everybody, David and Michelle's comments. Thank you, Janine. That was excellent. So the last word will go to Michael. Okay, so I want to pitch some questions here about the future of religion and not lest you think I'm coming from a neoliberal perspective that says, well, you're just not making enough money. Your <laughs> revenues are really low. No one wants to take your major. So let's amalgamate you with some other department. I'm not coming from that take on it at all. In fact, I'm, I have a far more critical view that's shaped by another conversation that's happening in the social sciences. And some of these ideas and questions come from Emmanuel Wallerstein and his development of world systems theory, uh, where he's asked some questions about the modern world and universities and disciplines themselves. Sometimes we talk about the discipline of religious studies as if this is the way religion has been studied forever. <laughs> You know, and not recognizing that even the history of disciplines is a 19th century modern development out of liberal ideology, which viewed the modern world as what? It's one that's differentiated so that we have politics separated from religion, separated from family, separated from economics, and then universities develop all of these disciplines that are not only differentiated from one another, but are also highly specialized. And not only do they have and contain the knowledge of their subject in that area, they also reproduce the knowledge in certain ways. So when you look at the etymology of the word discipline, it actually is doctrine. And so the doctors become the ones who not only produce, but also reproduce the doctrine of the discipline. And a lot of what differentiated sociology from anthropology and political science and economics revolved around questions of methods and some focus of study, right? Sociology was on the modern world. Anthropology was on the non-Western, non-Christian, uncivilized world, right? So you had this sort of dichotomy uh, or differentiation and specialization you know, based upon those kinds of ideas. But these disciplines crystallized by 1945. You know, post-World War II, they are so thoroughly enmeshed in our, our, our uh, structures of our universities and in our own minds about how the world looks, you know, that all of these areas are different from one another. And so religion develops a little bit, you know, more, you know, lately, certainly in Canadian universities, I think sociology was the same thing. It's not really until the 1960s that these disciplines crystallize, you know, and become these, but in creating a discipline, and some people argue, well, we're not really a discipline, we're a focus of study, we're multidisciplinary. Okay, do you have a budget? Do you have a chair? Are you structured in the department as a discipline like other disciplines? Yes. Okay. So, you know, maybe some of you are not, and your study of religion is, you know, pushed into some other discipline, uh, but they're still within the structure of the university, this sense of, you know, they're, they're differentiated, they're specialized. And Wallerstein critiques some of this and says, you know, what, are we really that different from one another? How do we come to a more holistic understanding of knowledge and also raises these questions about power? Who owns this knowledge? So let's ask that about religion. Who owns this knowledge of religion and religious studies? And how is that knowledge from us as doctors being passed on to other students? Uh, are we just discovering new knowledge about religion? Are we reproducing students to pass on the same kinds of ideas that we already have about religion rooted in a differentiated specialized world at the modern Western university? You know, or do we need to, to, to you know, you, you know, not just think about the future of the study of religion from a neoliberal perspective, but maybe to reimagine and critique 
the current modern university, which is perpetuating differentiation, got the school of business over there, they don't do the same thing as the school of nursing. Oh, you do religion, you go over to your own department, you do what you're doing. Well, we want to do interdis and interdisciplinary work is not new either. I mean, that's been something that's been talked about since post-World War II, which has been something of a pushback by people feeling like, why am I just talking to myself in my own department? So this conversation, even among religious studies scholars about doing multidisciplinary is, and interdisciplinary work is not new. It's something that's been going on for quite a while. So to, here, here are my questions I'll throw out. Is religious studies a discipline? What are the stories religious studies departments, faculty, students tell about who they are, what they study, how they think, think, feel, and act about religious studies? How does religious studies differentiate itself from other disciplines? What is this process of boundary making saying about religious studies, including our attempts to either you know, be more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or to carve out a piece of land for ourselves at the university that we protect? Has religious studies run its course and is it time to reimagine the study of religion and its relationship more broadly to the humanities and social sciences or the school of business or the school of nursing or the school of education? How do we think about, you know, this thing we've inherited about, you know, inherited a, as far as a modern Western university that separates and specializes into disciplines? Uh, and can we rethink something beyond a conversation in religious studies to even rethinking you know, what we do um, as a university. So these, these, when we think about religious studies, it's interesting how you know, religious studies develops as a discipline and it defines itself over and against theology. This is, who, it's not, this is who we are. It's, that's not what we do over there. We don't do theology, we do religious studies. And so, okay, so think about that story. In sociology, it's interesting how conversations are saying, should we as sociologists of religion revisit theology? What can we learn from the study of theology? Not just a theology and, or a particular one, but even the discipline of theology itself, you know, as a discipline. Uh, and so in this new book, uh, Wiley Handbook, Blackwell Handbook on, on religious studies of which I have a chapter in there in globalization, there is also a chapter on theology. Uh, and so, you know, these ongoing debates about the place of religious studies in the university, you know, we've, we've internalized them as, as debates about the definition of religion and the study of religion. So we talk about, you know, well, should we study religion as organization, religion as social movement, religion as spirituality? And then we have other arguments about, well, what about religion and politics, religion and literature? Uh, religion and, and so we have these ongoing sort of internal sort of debates about what exactly are we studying, how do we define it. Um, but I think that, I, I, I wonder if we should be raising the level of our debate from not just an internal one, but an external one about the very nature of knowledge and the production of knowledge and what role we play in producing and reproducing religious knowledge as, as faculty and as students and as scholars and its relationship to the university as a whole uh, that has been highly specialized and differentiated. And so when I say, is it time to call for the end of religious studies? I don't mean in the sense of collapsing because of economic reasons into other departments, but to ask these larger questions about you know, what we do, how we do it, our place in the university, the role of universities as products of 19th century uh, liberal ideology, specialization, differentiation, and uh, these kinds of ways in which uh, the modern university has been conceived in the West, and whether or not that is the best way for us to think about it in relationship to the world in which we live in that is far more global, uh, and, and, uh, and thinks about these kinds of questions perhaps differently than we have in the West. I'll conclude there. Thank you very much, Michael. Great. This was very tasty, I would say. That was really good. Um, so I'm going to wrap things up for now at this point. And, uh, and 
uh, speak on behalf of the entire group. A really deep thank you to David Feltmate, Michelle Folk, Janine LeBlanc, and Michael Wilkinson. We can all clap in camera. Thank you. <laughs> this was a fantastic conversation with, with all um, a good representation of the experiences of teaching religion, of religious studies uh, now. And I'm so happy that we had this conversation again. And I look forward to um, to the future of what the CSSR can provide in these moments of always trying to to to, to move with with uh, what uh, Michael talked about the uh, producing religious knowledge in each of our fields, right? So in each of our places and each of our our areas and where we live and where we relate to. So, uh, merci, hi hi, and merci beaucoup, everybody. Uh, this is an excellent pre uh, presentation. So I will press stop.